I have a couple different PR people that send me like profiles of people they're working with or like, hey, do you want to talk about this movie? And I actually reached out when I saw a, a post about you from a, a certain PR company. And I was like, I have to get him on. And I actually sent a message in the style of Jigsaw um, <laughs> saying like, I need you to, uh, I have a challenge for you. I need you to get this interview. And um, I, I love the Saw franchise. I have so many questions I want to, I want to ask about working on this film. But before we get into that, I want to know about the movies that made you. So I always like to say, Filmmakers make films, films make filmmakers. What are the films that made Nick Matthews? I grew up in like a very conservative, fundamentalist, Christian kind of home in South Carolina, Kentucky. And, um, you know, I wasn't allowed to go to the movie theaters. Uh, and I, but media and literature and storytelling was still very much valued in my home. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was this weird dichotomy of, you know, you can't go to the theaters and and for a while movies were censored pretty heavily. Um, we even had a, this device that would like censor when a bad word was said. And the TV was, Guardian? Yes, we had a TV <laughs> Guardian. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, but as I got older, I, I loved literature and my dad actually has a master's in English hmm. literature. So we had books everywhere. So I was reading Kafka and Hemingway as early as like sixth and seventh grade. And I was fascinated by this sort of like uh, these sort of stories, this sort of like yeah. dark and real, but also like, a, you know, a little magical realism and uh, this sort of like grotesqueness of some of those, those stories. And I got interested in Southern Gothic and some of yeah. that sort of material. And then I started, we always watch movies. My dad showed me at, like Lawrence of Arabia when I was in third mm. grade. And I remember being really struck by that. And he showed all of us like 2001 space odyssey when we were kids. And he's like, you have to see this movie. And so there was a real love of cinema in my f family. And yeah. my dad actually showed us for like Halloween's. I remember as like a tiny kid, he took all me and my siblings and, and was like, all right, guys, we're going to watch the original Frankenstein, the original Dracula. Mm. And then we're going to finish it off with Abbott and Costello's like, Frankenstein and Dracula. By the time we got to Abbott and Costello, we were all so freaked out yeah. that like the, the comedic elements of that didn't end up working. And I think I, I think I slept in a big puddle with all my uh, four other siblings that night. Um, mm -hmm. So I had a love of cinema, but when I what actually got me interested in film in in my life was I'd had a big move um, away from all my friends and everything I'd ever really known when I was mm -hmm. in about seventh or eighth grade. And I started watching, you know, Lord of the Rings came out around that time, mm -hmm. Gladiator, some of that, that dates, you know, exactly where I am in my life. Um, but I had a real connection with Lord of the Rings and the yeah. literature. Of it. And then when I started seeing the movie and all the making of that really caught my interest and mm -hmm. attention. And at the same time, I'd have like a friend come over to my house at some point and be like, oh, your parents have a video camera. Like, do you want to just make like a movie with it? And so we went out and we, like my brother had a bow and arrow and we like went and we shot this scene of someone shooting an arrow and then like, ah, uh, you know, we like whip pan in and we're yeah. doing like all in camera editing. It's like mini DV tapes right. and we're backing them up and just like go one frame earlier and then like get this sort of thing. So that I was doing that. And then the movie that actually made me say, I want to make movies, weirdly enough, was The Elephant Man, mm. uh, David Lynch's yeah. film. It's black and white. It's really literary it's very like you know there's a lot of metaphor in it there's a lot of um it's a really beautiful story about humanity and what makes us human mm. and you know like it i think this sort of film about like someone that's perceived by society as a monster but is this really intelligent and kind soul like that yeah. something about that movie really captivated me and i would say that you know, all through high school at that point, like this was DVD Netflix, right? This is, you yeah. have a subscription, you're getting stuff mailed in from that point on. I really did start watching everything from battleship Potemkin to, you know, um, Solaris to, uh, the shining to, you know, and I, I really invested in wanting to watch movies more and more and more. And because 
despite being in like a really conservative religious home, I kept pushing the boundaries. And, you know, every time I was dad was like, that's the most violent thing you'll ever watch yeah. in this house. I was like, well, what if we watch this? Right. Uh, so like, I did keep like pushing that. And weirdly in that culture, there's like a very, there's a big interest in, you know, I mean, there's, it's a very violent, uh, you know, it's a story of like the sacrifice. It's a story yeah. of blood. It's a story, you know, there's a lot of songs about that. And there's also a lot of songs about good and evil. And there's a lot, you know, in that sort of framework. And so I think there was an acceptance of the macabre and of like, you yeah. know, darkness and sort of graphic violence like that, but much less so surrounding sexuality or anything like right. that. Yeah. So yeah. for me, yeah, the like, I, I ended up co- connecting a lot with like seven. I connected a lot with um, Seventh Seal. I don't mm-hmm. know if sevens, everything was seven. And, <laughs> I don't know. Very superstitious. Uh, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Bergman was a big influence in, in yeah. high school. Like, um, you know, I love the Godfather. I love like Coppola. Like I do think that like, you know, I remember the first time I watched that movie and the way it made me feel and watching the Godfather part two and like just being taken through this like massive kind of epic story about family and, you know, it, 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 in sort of like what it does to Michael Corleone and like that sort of yeah. the way that the movie starts and the way the movie closes and like a lot of that just really captivated me. But I just, I really had no grander knowledge of cinema because the world I grew in up in just didn't respect it and it wasn't right. you know, something that they were pursuing. So for me, it all felt like new discovery and I felt that way ever since. And, yeah. um, I, I'll tell you the, you know, when I saw, I saw Saw, the very first one, I was, we would go to Blockbuster and we would get, you know, we'd still get movies there. And I was so excited to see the movie. I remember people talking about it. Even I worked at a religious organization in high school and okay. I, I like volunteered and did like, um, I was a uh, post PA. So I was doing like, you know, dad, like tape logging and right organization and it was like my first job quote unquote in the industry and um i remember people at work talking about it because they were all media savvy and they were you know these were even in the religious world like these were people who were very interested in what was coming out what was being made and so i was so excited about it i wanted to see it and i kept pressuring my parents to like to be able to watch it um and eventually they caved and they're like just don't talk to anyone at your church about this <laughs> right like, hey, well. so my younger brother and i watched it and as soon as we finished we dashed upstairs and we're like that movie was crazy and we started talking about it and then we turned around and there was a fa- like two families from our church just like standing there and we're like oh, so well, funny it is what it is. We, yeah we have so many touch points that i did not know before starting this interview so i grew up in fundamental baptist super conservative circles um and uh actually host another podcast all about that world um but grew up the same way my mom was a literature teacher so we were able to read and watch things that a lot of my friends weren't allowed to um you know and same thing push the boundaries i want to watch this like um i you know my mom was very open but it was like it was like classic movies right so like we had a strict rule, like no R rated movies. That was like the, the unbreakable rule. And then when I was probably 12 or so, we watched psycho and the movie ended and we were like, wow, they didn't show anything. My mom was so fascinated with like, you feel like you saw something you didn't, but like, why can't they be, you know, why can't they be movies like that? Now they have to show everything. And we're watching and the credits roll. And at the very end of the credits, it says this film has been rated R by the Motion Picture Association of America. And we all looked around at each other like, that was my first R-rated movie. <laughs> it's like such, a, oh my God, such yes. a shock for but that, but that was kind of when there was this pivot of like, okay, well, not everything R is bad. And I started to push into George Romero's movie, started to push into, you know, by the end of high school, it was like, I'm watching all these evil dead, you know, Sam Raimi movies. And um, yeah. And it's funny um, because when I turned, which tells you my age, when I turned um, 18, the new evil dead <laughs> was coming out. Evil dead, the Fetty Alvarez remake. Yeah. And which I worked I, with Shiloh. Fernandez oh, really? On. Oh, yeah, cool. So weirdly have like multiple evil dead connections. I also worked with Ted. 
you'll appreciate this. And that was my first theatrical experience. So like I had never gone to the theater. It came out right around my birthday. And I told my dad, I said, I really want to see it. And he's like, you're turning 18. It's your choice. And so I made that choice. (laughs) I went and it was like one of the coolest to this day. It was one of the coolest theater experiences ever because that movie just blows the roof off. So that's amazing. That's really interesting to hear because yeah, like I didn't see the prestige was my first Hmm. uh, movie in a theater. And I had, this was in college, you know, and I, had, I, and I was like, I, you'll probably know the names. I worked at the creation museum. And okay. I, yeah. Yeah. I also, um, I was going to yeah, ask about Bob, Bob Jones. Yeah. So yeah, I, I figured South Carolina. Yeah. Yeah. So in my parents worked at the university and wow. my dad worked for the press and then I was actually homeschooled in high school. Um, and just like, you know, which, but at the same time, like, uh four of my siblings or i have four siblings three of them are queer of some variety mm. like you know um and so i think we've all kind of like found our own path in a way yeah uh, but it's but yeah like those have been formative that's crazy that we have like such well a, i mean the tv guardian like yeah. there's so much inside baseball which like you know people listen to this for saw are like i don't care about any of this but it's <laughs> but it is, it is such a funny it's such a funny thing like all of those experiences and it is it, it, in a way sometimes it's i still will be like oh i haven't seen this because we weren't allowed to watch like you know this movie for a long time but on the other side too it's been so interesting discovering movies to this day that are like huge pop culture influences that yeah. i'm slowly catching up to and the perfect segue into saw um you know, we watched a lot of things we weren't supposed to. We snuck a lot of movies, we pushed boundaries and stuff. And the way that I was introduced to Saw was we were going, I, I played on our school, our private school basketball team, which very prestigious. And we were <laughs> in the van going from around Palm Springs to Chico, California. So Southern California, Northern California, it's like several hour drive. And one of my friends had all of the Saw movies downloaded to, I think his PlayStation Portable or his, his uh, I, whatever, iPod. Yeah. And I'd never heard of it. We're sitting down and we just watched through the whole series, like in the back of the van, <laughs> like just, oh my God. And the the first movie, <laughs> when the Hello Zeps theme starts playing and it starts unraveling what actually happened, we're all just in there like, oh my God. And then just kept going through the the entire series, and so, um, yeah, man, it, that's that's really interesting. I could t- I could talk forever about um, like, like that that weird bubble because it is, um, you know, I've, I've chatted with so many people from the Bob Jones world. I was near like West Coast, and you know, it's yeah, it's funny talking to people who like actually kind of found their way through media, you know, coming out of that world. And it is funny because, like you said the Bible's a gory, <laughs> brutal book. You're singing songs yeah. about being washed in blood, you know, and then you're like, yeah, can I please watch saw? I would love to do yeah. that. It's, it's connected <laughs> in some way. Yeah. Read judges. Like, uh, you know, read like they're very like, and also like, uh, if you take, uh, just like a more literary, like perspective of the Bible, it's mm-hmm. and like, look at it as a historical document rather than like, you know, a guidebook to life or something. It's like, there are these like very primal stories told yeah. throughout and they're often very, you know, it's a very jealous God. It's a very, you know, it's a very like, there's a lot of violence. There's a lot of death. There's a lot of retribution. Um, you know, it's, yeah, it fascinates me because I, I like, even the first times I was operating a camera, you know, the mm-hmm. first short film I ever made was for like a church event, you know, and I, that was the first time I had something I shot exhibited in front of an audience. Same here. Yeah. You know, and then I think, um, and I went to a religious school like for my undergraduate. And so a lot of like, I've been operating since I was in high school and, you know, in college, it's like operating those like IMAG, like live event things, but it's like, you actually get really fucking good yeah. operating. If you have 3000 people watching you, like sit there and then you're like okay they're gonna do this fucking cue on the band so we got to do this dutch zoom in yeah. like you know and it's like actually those were there was like a pretty good training ground for yeah. um yeah like it was actually there was a lot there and like there's a lot that i i still am like kind of uncovering about what it taught me or what i 
yeah. you know what I mean? Ways it influenced. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was my first time ever showing anybody anything. It was the same thing. I mean, smaller environment than a, than a Bob Jones, but you know, I was in like a 250 person church, you know, and in junior high, I'm running around at youth activities with a camera shooting recap videos. I'm staying up all night, drinking Mountain Dew, editing and showing Sunday morning. And like it, it was a very unique environment. And it's one of the things that I am appreciative of is like, I had a captive, literally a captive audience to show whatever I wanted to show. Um, And yeah, all of that experience you know, I have a lot of unpleasant memories in that world, but it is interesting, like going back and be like, man, all of my, all of my first projects were that, you know, all of my life was kind of in that circle. So um, yeah, that's super, super interesting. Um, I'm curious, stepping into your career, I mean, yeah. coming out of Bob Jones, I have to imagine you were like, I'm going to remake Sheffy and it's going to be the most amazing, <laughs> uh, most amazing picture ever made. Um, no, what was your, what was your original trajectory? You was it? <laughs> yeah. For two people will appreciate that. Um, We'd kind of like to know who we're obliged to. I'm Robert Sheffy. What was your kind of goal? Like, were you looking to go into broadcasting? Was it always, I want to be a cinematographer? Was it, I'm going to be a director? Like, what was the the path you wanted to go out on? Yeah. Yeah. So for me, originally, like when I was in high school, I thought I wanted to be an author and I, mm. you know, I was writing stories. I was writing novels. Um, I don't think I ever finished a novel, but I wrote a lot of short stories. And then um, as I sort of started to fall in love with cinema and liter- and and filmmaking, I I remember I met with like, you know, the, like, by the time I was in high school, we had moved to Kentucky and I was working for Answers and Genesis. My dad was working at Answers and Genesis as the Creation Museum was being built and made. Wow. And so I actually had a firsthand seat to watch something go from nothing into like, you know, a create, once again, it's, it's a specific thing made for a specific subset of people. Right. But because my dad was one of the writers on a lot of the material in the, in the Creation Museum, I was actually, I had a backhand, you know, this front hand seat to like that place being built and made. That also was part of what inspired me and intrigued me. And so I remember my older, my older brother, he played flute and he ended up going to USC and he had Hmm. a scholarship to go to USC and he'd won like a number of like national flute competitions and kind of went off. And so like arts were very much something that my parents supported and support us following at the time I was really religious and I wanted to go to a Christian school. So I ended up going to this place called Cedarville university Mm. and I, they didn't really have much of a program. I thought they had more of one than they did to be honest. Um, But I knew at that point that I, like I had read like books on film directing. I had read some of the like textbooks that were available, but I didn't really have like a huge sense of what it was. And a lot of the way things get made at this like smaller university level, it's like you making your own thing, editing it, shooting it. There's no real sense of like what a crew does or the size of a crew or what it takes. So it it was very like self-directed, I would Mm -hmm. say in a lot of ways. And then at the end of that process, I went to this um, place in California called the Los Angeles Film Study Center for a semester. And I met, you know, there were maybe 50 students and we all got to, we were all tasked with writing a short and they chose four of the shorts to create into like final projects. And then everybody that wanted to direct could put their reel together and show the professors. And so I put my reel together and I ended up writing one of the shorts that was made and then directing one. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't let you direct around because they were like, no, we want you to learn to think in a different sort of capacity. And it was during that semester, I was working as a PA on um, this movie called Pete Smalls is Dead that had Lena Headey, had mm. Mark Boone Jr. and Peter Dinklage. And, you know, this was before Game of Thrones. Yeah. Um, and so it was a really interesting and exciting project for me. And also we did a lot of set dressing with pornography. The There was, you know, a lot of scandalous things happening because a lot of people were NYU grad students and they were living a very free lifestyle. Right. I remember one of the PAs and I like, stumbled across like we were we were driving everyone to location and stuff and someone left a camera in the back of one of 
our cars and he was like do you know who this is and i'm like no and it's like just turn it on and see whose photos it's of and then you can figure out who to give it to he turned it on and then it's just a bunch of people having sex <laughs> like it was a very like it's one of these Holly. people yeah right. <laughs> yeah like i don't know and so um at that time i would i had never not shot something that i had directed hmm. um except i think maybe one short and i remember being sort of upset that i wasn't going to be able to shoot my project right. and that was kind of the first time i was awakened to like oh there's a director of photography there's a cinematographer it's a team I had people, yeah. yeah and i had people telling me about roger deakins and emmanuel lebesky mm. and so that actually started like i i knew directors and names of directors but i didn't and i thought i wanted to direct at first mm -hmm. i mean i think most people get in because they wanted to, to direct because they're like that's all they really know about who makes movies and, yeah. and you know, and maybe, you know, the writer, or the actors, but I think as you know, the internet at that time, like DSLRs were just this, we were still shooting on like two third inch chip cameras. <laughs> and yeah. like, you know, I think I used a Z1U to shoot those short films. And then I got out and I started using the XL1 and then the HVX 200. And then, and then the 5D hit the world and kind of changed, changed things. everything. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, for me, it was like, I knew by the end of that semester, I knew I wanted to be a cinematographer and I, but this was in 2009 and the economy crashed right as I was graduating. And I moved back to Cincinnati. Uh, I got married and started working at the creation museum because I had worked there in high school yeah. and in the, it, I was there for four years. And while I was there in the process of sort of the dogma of the place the sort of rhetoric of the plays, um, the experience, you know, I'd already had a lot of challenging experiences in Christianity and, right. and especially Christian fundamentalism. And I had sort of walked into a more progressive space and into more emergent church, you know, church sort of space and thinking. Yeah. But that process really, in a lot of ways, like I walked away from faith in that like time period because mm. of working, working there and being, you know, at that place. And so, um, while I was there, I was also starting to make, you know, I was doing stuff for the museum, shooting and editing, and also a lot of AV, a lot of sound, like setting up sound and projection. Yeah. I just needed a job. Like I didn't, you know, and at the time I was like, well, I don't know how I end up, if I'll ever have a chance to do this or if yeah. I'll ever end up being able to do this. Right. And so I, and I was pretty depressed about it too, because I, I had been like, I went to school to go make movies and now I'm like, you know, doing this and it's not really paying me that well. And I'm not making the kinds of movies. Cause for me, even when I was very much in a religious space, I wanted to make movies that were about the human experience. Right. Movies that explored like our, you know, our mortality movies that explored what it is to be human, what it is to brood and to think and to wonder and to ponder mm -hmm. the possibility of the world movies that make you question your point of view and your perspective. It's why I've always loved foreign cinema. It's, mm -hmm. it asks you to question your own sense of what is community? What is, you know, what is good? What is, what is the good life? What does it mean to feel, what is family? You know what I mean? And it's like all these bigger questions about life that stories, mm -hmm. you know, the stories we tell sort of ask and, and ponder about. Right. And so I always wanted to make movies like seven and Shawshank Redemption. And even in that time frame, cause I was like, these are, movies about you know i was making mer like my first right. short film at you know christian college was somebody walking into a, cr a room and it was a cr full of dead bodies and it's like there's blood everywhere and i mean i remember i made my actor i didn't understand continuity fully i didn't understand that we could redress the scene so it's like you're dead you're staying here until we're done shooting the <laughs> For, <movie."> forever yeah. <laughs> like you can't get up because then the continuity will be fucked you know it's like you'll get yeah. blood every it's like of course you have to let this person they can't lay on the ground for 17 hours straight but like i just you know i was like you make a movie and you do it in a day and like yeah um and i was so i ended up what i would do is i would shoot every time we had a project for the creation museum i would shoot uh that, that project and we got to do some cool stuff we got to do some pretty big set builds and stuff that you know it's like no, they had it's a bit time. of budget yeah uh, yeah and then in the process we would rent like you know, Red Epic, and we would rent like a three ton truck, and we would rent like a Fisher Dolly and to do the job for them. And then one of the guys I worked with there, he and I would go and we would make, you know, we would make a short or we would make 
a, a commercial or we would try to make a music video. So we really worked a lot together and both of us wanted to make films. We were watching stuff like Snowtown Murders. And, mm -hmm. you know, the first time I watched Evil Dead was a day we got snowed in at the Creation Museum. You That's know what so I mean? Funny. And it's like, yeah. yeah. So I, and then I hit a point where I was like, if I don't, I was about 24, 25. This was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I hit a point where I was like, if I don't try to go to LA or New York and make movies, really what happened was I had that moment of like, I don't want to do this the rest of my life. And I'm right. really nervous about staying here and I, I'm ready to move on and I'm ready to do something else. Yep. And so I talked to a number of cinematographers. I talked to somebody who was local in Cincinnati, this guy named Jeff Barkledge, who was really kind and showed me like his gear. And, you know, he had worked on some stuff, but um, nothing huge, but he'd made a living as a cinematographer and he'd worked, you know, he worked on Shawshank Redemption as a grip on, and saw Roger Deakins and had done, yeah. you know, so there was story there. Right. And he was really kind and supportive. And then I had made some friends when I was in LA because I, worked on some USC grad student shorts as, you know, and met some people through that. And so my friend, uh, now really good friend, Sean Connedy, who's a commercial DP, I had talked to him and I'm like, where do I go? And I reached out to a few other people in New York and LA. And they were basically all like, look, if you want to make movies, you got to be in New York or LA mm -hmm. because people get hired from there and flown to other places. They don't yeah. hire the local DPs. It's just what it is. And so, you know, I looked at production companies all throughout Cincinnati, like, from Cleveland down to Nashville. And I just didn't see anyone doing the kinds of movies sure. and things I wanted to do. So I packed up, you know, I quit my job, talked to my wife first. We talked about it for a while, packed up and um, they moved to Los Angeles. And then I had a reel at the time and that was about it. And I didn't tell, I didn't tell anybody for probably five years that I'd worked at the creation museum because I was so nervous. People would be like, you're that religious guy. Your reels just Ken um, ham like, talking in front of you know forests yeah, <laughs> it's like exactly. not the best reel you know yeah exactly which like look i've done you know i edited i was one of the editors on like their like ken's like main series like the foundations project or whatever it's called yeah you know like i just yeah i have a, in, a more intimate knowledge of that world than like i think will ever be useful but, right right unless i end up trying to tell a story about it at some point but i'm not there yet um but yeah, like I, so when I moved to LA, I had a reel, I had a website, but I was like, how do I do this? And I was terrified. You know, I'd saved up some money enough that like, if I didn't, I think I gave myself six months and I was like, mm. if I can't no. make any money doing this, then like, I'll try to find something else. Yeah. And I, um, you know, I started booking jobs off like Craigslist and Mandy. I got really lucky and booked this half million dollar movie that was wow. like a, you know, uh experimental horror film and there was a lot of nudity in it there was like this like cult scene where there's like 20 naked people dancing and like there's you know a lot of weird violence and we're we're watching films like irreversible as mm -hmm. you know inspiration and we're watching films like uh what was that it's like black and white brand upon the film that i can't remember the name of doesn't matter you know but it's like it's like a play almost that's like made into a film like it was very yeah we watched i watched suspiria for the first time before yeah. making that and like so that kind of you know started my career i think i had a lot of misconceptions about what having a career in hollywood would be and i yeah. think i shot my first movie and i was like oh my god i shot my first movie i'm gonna make it um that movie is still never released <laughs> you know it played at the nashville film festival like three years after i shot it yeah um the director was you know, someone that I really never wanted to see again after we shot it because mm. he was total asshole to the crew and myself and just like, you know, completely, it was not always a great experience. I had to drive the truck, the grip and electric truck because the rate, they didn't have a driver and the rates were too low for me to ask my guys to do it. Yeah. And so, and I ran it into a gas station, like, cause I didn't check the clearance height. You know what I mean? There was a lot of like first time mistakes that I made. Um, I didn't understand labor laws. I didn't understand how to fight for the crew and the crew's needs. Um, and also that that would make a better film, you know? Yeah. And so visually we did some things I'm really, I was really proud of. That was, I think I've done 10 movies now. Yeah. So that was a while ago. And really what it is, is you get to LA and you just, I, for me, like I had to find my voice and I also had to find how to like, you know, 
how to do this and make a career of this and actually navigate being in Los Angeles and navigate making a career out of it. And that's, right. we can go any direction with that you want, but that's been yeah. its own journey, really. It's got to be weird going, there's this movie I watched very young, you know, pushing to watch, like, can I watch Saw? Now yeah. we're on Saw X and it's like, yeah. I'm working on this project. That's a very weird yeah. <laughs> full circle moment. And then on top of that, beyond just your personal connection to it, this is one of the most iconic horror franchises ever. <laughs> you know, like I was, I was listening to the soundtrack um, just this morning and I was going like, this is probably in the top five or 10 iconic horror scores. Like there's so much it launched James Wan's career. Like there's a lot of history and lore and connection to this. So like stepping into a project like this, I know it's an, I know it's a tired question probably, but how much pressure did you feel stepping into this world for the first time, especially when you have Kevin has directed three edited seven, Charlie Clauser yeah. the music on all of the movies. Like you've got a very veteran crew, you know, yeah. to this franchise. I would say every single project I book, I feel an immense sense of pressure. Um, especially, well, narrative commercials. Uh, it's usually the pressure is just the speed, you know, it's sure. like often if I book a commercial, I'm on the job within a week, Yeah, you know, or it's very fast. And so it's usually like, how, am I going to be able to hire a crew quickly? Not? Right. One of the things for me with, so the way that it kind of happened was I got a call from my agent and he said, I have something you think you might be interested in. And I'd been doing, you know, I'd always wanted to do horror films and I always wanted to do thrillers. And I'd done this movie called Cuck back in like 2018, 2019. It upset a lot of people. It was pretty polarizing. It sort of played in a variety of spaces. And, but it also like had, you know, for me, like my work tends to be, it's fairly, there's a lot of shadow play. It's fairly dark. There's, you know, we use, I use color um, in a pretty like intentional way. I, I've la I layer color into the films that I create and okay. I usually craft an arc within the movies. And so my agent knew that this was the kind of work I was doing and interested in. And I'd done this like body horror short. And so I know they were looking for a DP at the time that had worked in Mexico city and Kevin had been interviewing a number of DPs and some people were interested, but Mexico city turned them off or, mm. you know, they, it was going to be a non-union film in Mexico city. So that wasn't going to be right for everybody. Um, however, I had done a movie in Mexico city like four or five years ago. And so I had a connection to the city. i had already made something there. I knew good crew there. I knew that in Mexico, your money, like, you know, and the, and the craftsmen and the technicians of Mexico, it would just mean that we had the possibility to go really big with what we were making. Right. Yeah. So yeah. that, when I got the call, I was, you know, my agent was like, you know, I think you might be interested in this. I was like, that's amazing. And he was like, you know, I'm going to set, get the script. You're, you know, you can read it today and then you'll have an interview today. And I was like, Oh, wow. so I read, you know, a working title draft of saw X, uh, the working title, I think was like party invite or some shit like that. Yeah. Um, just in case it got leaked. And, right. um, it as i was reading it i was like holy shit this is an amazing script like this yeah. is the best script of and i'd only seen one two and three of mm -hmm. the franchise i hadn't seen anything else but i was like this is the best script of any of these movies that i'd like seen and i was like you know the excitement about i was like it's jigsaw as the lead it's you know john kramer we've never been placed into john kramer's world we've never gotten the chance to explore his world mm -hmm. we've never been able to subjectively just like sit with him tobin bell's an amazing performer i mean the, he's been in everything from like mississippi burning to you know obviously saw and it's like right so i think that got me really excited as i was reading it and i'd seen kevin's lookbook and kind of what he was you know saw as a world where like it's a world in inky darkness where mm -hmm. pinpricks of light are kind of you know coming in through like the cracks in the walls and it, there's like everything slimy and a little wet and you know it makes you feel like you want a tetanus shot and there's all right. these like art cynical greens and ochre yellows and crimson reds and you know it's it's a film that's it's a franchise that's really like giallo inspired i mean deep billy is very much pulled from deep red and so 
I was able to see the kind of some of what he was drawing from. And then Kevin and I just had a conversation that night. So I think I had two hours between when I read the script and wow. we talked. So I didn't, it wasn't that I had like a lookbook put together. It wasn't that I had like a fully fleshed out. It was more just, we had a conversation about the story, about the script, about what we loved about Saw, about what we, you know, thought, like we loved that the early films were textural and pretty and not digital and clean and not like, you know, I didn't want, this was the very first conversation, you know, and that we loved, you know, the thir- look of 35 millimeter and mm-hmm. love this, like very much this deep contrast, deep fall off, you know, it's darkness and then light and then darkness and then light. Yeah. And we started talking about, you know, other movies we liked and and literature that we liked and, you know, everything from Cormac McCarthy to, I think I pulled probably like a Sally Mann book off my shelf or mm-hmm. like a Gordon Parks book off my shelf or like I have, um, yeah, like I have a bunch of photography books and and one of those books is even just like a book of cadavers from like, you know, the 1920s. And it's like, so being able to re- reference that and talk about that and we just clicked, you know, I think we talked for an hour and a half. Um, and then he uh, reached out and asked if I could send over some uh, directors that I'd worked with. And so I sent over the names of five that I shot movies with and he talked to all of them and, you know, they were like Nick's collaborative and he's great at what he does. So hire him. I think one of my friends told me his response was, you'd be a fool not to hire him. Nothing else. <laughs> I was like, okay, Nick. Perfect. That's- Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, um- yeah, book the job. And then I was, I think that I felt like I can do this. And frankly, like Saw has some really iconic images yeah. and some really iconic photography. But I also felt like there was so much more that could be explored. Right. And so the pressure more came from, I think I was, you know, it was over, was it overwhelming? I, I didn't, I didn't really sit there and think like, oh, like I just sat there. What I told Kevin in our first interview was, I was like, I think this is the best script of the franchise. And I think we have a chance to make the best movie of the franchise. And if that's what you want to do, then that's like, that's what I'm, you know, what I want to do. And so it was very much just like, I didn't know what it was going to be. And usually with a movie, you don't know where you're going to go right away. It's not like you have it all figured out from day one. It's the process is how you figure it out. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm I'm curious, and you kind of answered this a little bit, but I'm curious because, yeah. like, canonically, the Saw franchise is kind of it's kind of a meme at this point, like trying to track yeah. all the threads. <laughs> but this one, pretty simple. It's between Saw. It's between and Saw Two, yeah. and then, but you also have Jigsaw, you know. And I'll drop a spoiler warning for all the other Saw movies before. But Jigsaw takes place before saw and saw two jigsaw is a lot more blockbuster esque and very yeah. clean what you described very clean very digital feeling did you try at all to marry those two elements in the new project or was it just let's return to form if someone's watching saw then this then saw two it fits yeah. right in or was there any attempt to bring in that jigsaw look and aesthetic for kevin and i those were our those were the the last few saw films are kind of our least favorite of the franchise and they were the ones i think that's shared by fans too i think that's a pretty common yeah yeah and when kevin and i talked he was like because i think i had two weeks before i flew to mexico and then i was there for a while um and i was like which movie should i be watching like just to kind of start prepping for this and thinking about this and so of the Saw franchise, he was like, watch one, two, three, and and six. Mm-hmm. You don't need to see anything else. And so like for this, us to make this movie. And so I've actually, yeah, like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even watch Jigsaw. I didn't watch like Spiral. I wasn't, you know, of course I've looked at images from both of the movies, mm-hmm. but I just, I wasn't really interested in doing what they did or being influenced by what they did. Sure. So I think we, when we first started talking, it was like, I was like, I love 185. You know, I was like, I think 185 felt right for this movie for a number of reasons. That was a that was an early conversation, an early decision. Um we yeah, for us it was very much like we're not trying, we weren't trying to merge those looks. I think those films were attempts for the franchise to move in a different direction, or those films were attempts for them to look at other modalities. And like I'm sure the people making them like you know, it was, I don't know any of the filmmakers that made those films. And Kevin was involved yeah. with some of them in a variety of capacities. Right. 
but um you know they were trying to do something different and so for us when we started talking we were like no the early films are 185 close-ups you know in the way that john's face is going to look in this movie mm -hmm. will look better in 185 yeah. um there's you know saw has it has monitors which are boxes it has traps in this film that you know happen in like a vertical space or there's like you know something where it's like shooting in two three five would have actually been prohibitive for the way that we wanted to shoot the movie right and so i think we decided very early on let's go 185 we started immediately looking for you know i was like i want to use vintage class i know we're gonna to have to shoot digitally but in a perfect world we would shoot digitally and go do a film out we knew that would never be a budget thing we could do but it's like we started talking about how do we make this look like 35 millimeter and so that really led into from my the very beginning of my time in Mexico, I started testing cameras, I started testing lenses, and I had shot on, you know, they're really at the time there were only like I had a 4K capture mandate because we had to sh deliver in UHD. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that eliminated anything that wasn't the very cam, the Alexa Mini LF. Alexa 35, which was not really available at the time, especially not in Mexico. And then the Venice and mm -hmm. the Venice 2. Um, the Venice 2 was very unavailable and high, very overpriced for what we were, yeah. our budget was. The Alexa Mini obviously wasn't on the table. So really the choice, and the very cam I had not shot on, and frankly, it just dropped after it did the, they did the first three seasons of Ozark on the very cam. I haven't seen anyone use it since. Hmm. Um, so all everything's in Alexa Mini, Alexa Mini LF, or uh, I mean, some people are shooting on the red, but I just don't. It's, I, I've worked on it. Old and school I, now. <laughs> yeah, but just like not a lot of people are using it. And when you think of red, you you think of clean. You don't think of like mm -hmm. gritty and dirty. So for us, the real test became Alexa Mini LF and Venice. So in the process, you know, like we wanted the movie to sort of sit between one and two. And so we started testing those two cameras, pushing those cameras, you know, pushing the ASA on those cameras, um, you know, testing colors and, and the way that colors read on those cameras, and then also using vintage lenses. And what I ran into in Mexico was I couldn't get a hold of enough vintage quality lenses to go that were full frame. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, because Alexa Mini LF, we would have had to shoot full frame. Sure. Um, I think there is a mode where you can go super 35 on it now, but in general, like it felt like we were going to have to go full frame on that camera or super 35, you know, or full frame on the Venice. And what I found was I, the cameras were, were very similar in every other regard. Um, I do tend to lean towards uh, Airy just because I probably shot 95% of my work oh. on an Airy system. And on a fast but, schedule, you don't want to be learning. <laughs> no, Too and much, I had yeah. shot. Yeah, I had shot a project on the Venice before, so it was not completely new to me. Um, but what we found was there were just so many more lens options for the uh, for the Venice, and with you know the way that the characters are staged in some of these traps, we were going to want to be doing really long lenses, mm -hmm. and large format was going to be us fighting against ourselves in order to get long enough glass to get in their faces from mm -hmm. far away. So we, you know, I think I carried a 12 or a 14 millimeter. I carried a full set, uh, like a 12, or it might've been a 12. I think it was a 14 millimeter ultra prime. Then I carried a full set of the Cook Classic Pancro, like the modern, it's modern glass, but it's got vintage quality, similar sure. to like the Cook S2s and S3s. And then I carried a 200 millimeter and a 180, I think, or something. And then we, ba and we carried a Zoom. We had, I think we had a, but we could we could only carry the zooms like on specific specialty days. So I had a document that was ongoing as we were shot listing, where I would always list out the specialty gear because we couldn't afford to carry like a crane or steady cam or you know gimbals or like yeah. any of that material or like a lambda head. Those were not pieces we could carry the run of show. We had to carry those as specialty. So I was keeping an ongoing document of that. I had an ongoing document of all my lighting plots because I was working with a crew in Mexico city. So right. not everyone spoke English very, you know, a lot of them didn't speak English well. So I had to create a visual document. That was that. And then a document that was all the practicals yeah. in the movie. And that, that was listed out and there were pictures of what I wanted. Sure. Um, and so 
then we settled on filtration. Once we settled on the Venice and the Cook Classics, then I did a set series of tests with probably six different filter sets. Um, I used stuff. I used a Glimmer Glass, uh, Black Pro Mist, and then I started playing with this thing called Pearlescent. And Kevin just, you know, we knew that our actors were ultimately going to be 20 years older than they are in the timeline. Right. I was like, you look at Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, and I'm like, you just have to make that leap. I'm like, we aren't going the Irishman approach. We don't have, right. you know, the cost of de aging is well, expensive, and it's weird, deep fake shit. It's kind of a it's kind of a meme now, um, specifically for Saw. Is the you know Marvel is using all this money to de age people? Saw used the superior method of the backwards baseball cap. Yeah, on John, you know, on Tobin exactly. Bell, and um, I was curious with that. So there was no de-aging at all um and then was it just purely just i mean tobin bell it's funny to me anyway because tobin bells look the same for the last like two and a half decades like i watched a movie with him that he did probably three years ago and i was like he looks exactly the same as in 2004 saw you know so it's not yeah. too too much of a leap but i was curious yeah, I if because he's... yeah i think because he has cancer and because he's like mm. a, you know from the moment you see him on screen, he's like older and dying in the sense of like the character is. Yeah. I think, to yeah. And Tobin's face just really hasn't shifted that much. He's, yeah. he is a very like lively, you know, the man will do a jig and like, he likes to talk and, and like, you know, he wants to spend two hours. Like Kevin took him to the set before we ever shot there with him. And they talked for half a day, like about the blocking, mm. about what, because the, the set is John's world. Like John built this, you know? Yeah, so, right. He really cares. Like he cares about the character, the character's point of view. He in no part of like Tobin's head is John Kramer a villain. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there, there is a complete love of that, you know, character and that character's point of view and where he's coming from. And I really respected that. And Tobin Bell is like a very kind person. Mm -hmm. He's easy to be around. He's easy to work with. He's, you know, he's very, I just have only had good interactions with him. He's, uh, very generous. I faced a dilemma because, you know, that obviously was a conversation around Tobin, but it was also a conversation around Shawnee Smith. Right. And in this industry, people tend to focus on, you know, the age of women more than the age of men. And, you know, Shawnee has taken great care of herself. She looks fantastic. Um, but she is 20 years older. And so, you know, I have this mutual, mutually challenging conundrum of how do I uh, glamorize these actors to, you know, let them look a younger age a bit using lighting sure. and the tools of cinema, which we landed on a pearlescent one, which it does soften the features some, but it also gives a glow to the highlights and it gives a little more impressionism. And if you look at the trailer, you'll see, you know, we're cutting through the contrast reduction that pearlescent's doing with a, a steep grade. That's what I was going to ask about that. Yeah. Cause you lose yeah, the grit with that. Yeah, but we shot everything at 2000 ASA and we added, you know, we we were shooting vintage le vintage quality lenses. We were using this for, you know, the filter was more, in the end of the day, it does a little skin softening and a little um, highlight blooming, which I end up really liking. And then um, the steepness of the grade in terms of like what our contrast levels are and the sort of the, where the, you know, the black levels fall as well as, you know, shooting at 2000 ASA and like adding grain, you know, throughout the movie, those all became a way to like keep the grit and then the color palette and then sure. the style of camera movement. So I did face a lot of like, you know, most of my sleepless nights were about how I lit Shawnee's face. And the, I would say like, we're very successful in some parts of the movie and in other parts, I wish I had more time, you yeah. know, it's, we're shooting two cameras for the entire movie. It's a 33 day shoot. Um, most traps are shot in like a day, a day and a half. Holy cow. So yeah. it's, you know, Kevin will walk in and I mean, Kevin thinks like an editor, you know, his coverage is yeah. seven pages of coverage. So, and, and the design of the, the movie, the design of the, the look of the movie, I was very much lighting for two cameras. I was very much lighting. I started to think of it as like depth stage lighting where you're thinking my background is this color, then there's fall off. Then my midground has this color tone tonal palette. Then there's fall off, and then the foreground is lit by this. Yeah. And so I have lighting diagrams where you know 
for our main trap space, which is a giant warehouse, we tented the entire space. Um, so we had total control. And then we had lights rigged outside the warehouse and within the warehouse. And so I had, I think I designed, I think there's probably 40 units that are built in. And so all of those are LED, all of those are on a console so that I can completely control the color and tone of all of them. In the logic of the world, not all of those units are real, practical, industrial fixtures. And every single one of them has industrial housing. Like I worked with the art department and our production designer, Anthony Stabley, and his art director and his set decorator to make sure that every light is dressed. There's mm. no lights that you're seeing that are not dressed. It's oh, some wow. housing. So they're built in. And then if there, there might be stuff that's hidden away, but I knew we are going to see the ceiling. We are going to yeah. see everything's going to be. Seen. You're going to do those 360 saw shots around traps. And yeah, exactly. So we're lighting from above and uh, like the movie, because the movie goes, you know, moves from John's like drama and the scam to these trap sequences. And, you know, it, because the movie kind of moves from those and of course people have to be abducted in order to be in traps. So you have this arc, right. That it, the movie takes I wanted the photography to reflect John's arc. So we moved from the U S to Mexico. There's a color palette arc there, but also there's, we're lighting in more glamorized, beautiful tones, more, there's still drama. There's still, you know, dense shadows. There's still that there's still fall off. There's still chiaroscuro lighting, but it's, it's, it's more elegantly done. It's more dramatic in that regard. And yeah. then as the movie, you know, once there's this flipping point in the movie, which we do in a very small way, you know, we're doing height visuals, we're using zollies, we're using like stuff right. where we're stacking cameras next to each other and it's doing like, you know, flash flashes and we're doing lighting. The light moves from like beautiful to brutal. And even as the movie is happening, I designed it so that every trap that starts is designed to connect with circuits that are, you know, lights turn on and shut off with the start and stop of traps. Because my idea is these buttons are connected to circuits that start the traps and also change the lighting. John's mm. theatrical. He always has been. Look at the first time you see Billy, like, yeah, it's a big crash of a side light and then Billy comes, you know, mm. tricycling right. out. And so for me, I wanted to harken back to the early films in terms of palette. But I didn't like they got really excited about DI and DI was very new and color grading was very new at the time, you know, it was early 2000s. Yeah. So you had, I always described Saw as like seven by way of new metal music video. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got a big, you know, there's exclamation points everywhere. It's big. It's like in your face. Right. Yeah. I wanted our lighting to reflect that and our camera movement to reflect that. But for me, that meant but I didn't want to go like a heavy DI route where it's like, oh, the green is coming in post. The yellow yes. is coming. Yeah. I built it into all of the lighting. So a lot of our lighting has three dimensionality to it. There's, I'm using ochre yellow, key light. There's this, you know, green uh, accent lights. And then there's sodium vapor background, deep background lighting. And then as the traps turn on and off, you know, I knew that they would have a trailer cut. I knew that I didn't want all the traps to look the same, but also from an arc and just audience interest and also just every trap being uniquely its own thing, but still in the world of, you know, the movie. Um, I didn't want it to feel like Saw 1, where it's basically one look inside the game room. Sure. You know, like I wanted there to be a variety of looks, but it had to be motivated by John's point of view and how John would have crafted this and also had to be motivated by the traps. And so because of that, as traps conclude and start lights are turning off and turning on. And so yeah. that gave me like, for instance, and you've seen it in the trailer. It's like when Billy comes out, you know, I have a big backlight that just strikes mm -hmm. and it's very theatrical and dramatic. And then, you know, he drives out and then you, you know, you see this like three dimensional color palette, but it's, we flipped into like a blue green kind of world. And Kevin and I talked through what those palette shifts would be um, so that we were on the same page about the arc, but also so that when I went back and then we started to like play with the abduction sequences, I would take a color that was a tertiary color mm. in the trap. And I would use that as my primary color for the abduction scene. And okay. so these are the same palettes playing throughout in the U S it's silver blues, monochromatic, you know, um kind of yeah blues and grays and yeah and whites and living in kind of a mono, more chronic monochromatic space and then as we move into 
in Mexico, we have lush greens and reds and yellows and golds. And then as it gets dirtier and more brutal, the movie gets more and more like ochre. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the dirty yellow green. Yeah. Or cynical green. And, and like part of that was also as lights shut off, you know, I had lights built into the space, but it's like the lights get more and more centered. Right. And I know like mm-hmm. the original question was like, how do you deal with the older actors? Well, as those lights become more and more spotty and more and more down light and more and more brutal, you're just getting these deep, steep shadows and this like raccoon eyes and that sort of a, yeah. and so I kept eye lights on the cameras so I could constantly shape how much we see into their eyes versus not. But, you know, I would say for Amanda, if I could get in there with diffusion and soften it up and help it out a bit, I would, but also she like, you know, Shawnee understands that this is saw and like, I always favored the story over the glamour of the actors. Yes, and, I, yeah. and for me, like the grit and the brutality and the unease of the space and the feel of the space was more important than always shaping it on the actors. And this was lit, you know, this was lit to be brutal and, and graphic and grimy. So I, I think the actors look fantastic in it. And, you know, to, I know Tobin Cena, I don't know if Sean, Shawnee has, but it's, you know, I think, in general, people are very happy with how they look. And, you know, at a certain point you have to ask, this is, this just wasn't that movie. Like this just wasn't, you know what I mean? Like I would be upset if this movie was like suddenly Amanda's looking like completely glamorized. Like that's just not the movie. Right. Right. That was kind of the approach and there's no post de-aging. Um, I think we did, there's a bunch of VFX shots, but they're very elegantly done. I've seen them. And, um, and the VFX was mostly, you know, set extensions or cleanup, wire cleanup or whatever, yeah. stuff like that. It's not, um, I think we did one effect on Amanda when there's one shot where she like set her head on something and it just made a weird line across her face. And we're like, can we just get rid of the line? Like, it looks sure. weird. you know, so yeah. it's very minimal in that regard. Well, I want to be respectful for your time. I know that we're, we're like two minutes over. I want to ask, uh, one one question really quick about that so you know even the later movies there's always been a big emphasis on practical and i interviewed uh v neil who's like the makeup effects artist like so yeah. and uh if you're listening go check out that episode um but one of the things she talked about in the episode as a makeup person is as movies get cleaner as digital gets sharper as you're shooting in 4k you can see the seams more and more and there's a lot of cinematographers that can fail the makeup team in like how they shoot something and so an artist will be so frustrated that you know i created this effect that looks amazing in camera doesn't carry through um and that just doesn't roll in a saw movie like you're going to be you know, you're not cutting away from the violence in these movies. You're you're going in and seeing the bone pop out, or you're seeing you know someone's head twist a certain way, um, and you're seeing whatever those tubes do that are teased on the poster in this movie. Um, you know, approaching the shooting the makeup effects within this movie, like how collaborative was that with the makeup team? And I can't imagine you said you're shooting the traps in a day. I can't imagine you had a ton of resets to like let's get it again. We kind of flubbed that shot, you know, um, how tricky was that and how, you know, how different was it approaching such a visceral kind of movie? Yeah. Um, first of all, you're good on time and we can go, you know, I want you to get your questions answered. Um, I appreciate that. And I and like love talking about this movie. Um, yeah, it was, we were really fortunate that we got to work with this amazing team called fractured fractured effects. They had done Westworld. They did one of my favorite TV shows of all time, the Nick, Hmm. um, which is the Steven Soderbergh show. It's like medical horror, very graphic, Hmm. like extremely upsetting to watch in terms of just like the, the sheer, like the graphicness of it. Um, They did eyes of Tammy Faye, you know, so like they've done great prosthetics work, like across the board, just fantastic work. Um, and when they came on to the project, we knew that, in fact, we had to shift our schedule a bit because they came on kind of late and okay. they needed more time. So we actually shot all the non, uh, all the non effects work was shot in an early, like in, uh, last year. 
And then we took a down month in December for Christmas and for the New Year's. And then we came back and we shot the rest of the movie. So it was all the effects work, all the prosthetics work. And, you know, we didn't we didn't shoot it like, oh, we shot this scene and now we're picking up the prosthetics. It's like all the scenes that involve prosthetics we shot at, in the second leg. So what, because they were building those practical, or they're building those, uh, prosthetic pieces throughout. So, and it was a team of, I don't know, I think 30 people or something. It's oh a huge God. team. Yeah. So, but on set, what that means is they have two people from the, you know, from the company that com- came with us and maybe three people and they, all the pieces were already built. And so all of that stuff has been negotiated in advance. It's, you have two of these arms or legs or whatever, you've got two of these brains or to you know these eyeballs or whatever you're doing right yeah and so there's a limited amount of prosthetics because they cost a lot of money they have to be molded off the actors bodies and built specifically based on the actors bodies and photos as well as like you know actual mold casts that are made you know and so when you see them in person you're like i i would see like you know the actor and i would see the the prosthetic and i would be like i can't tell the difference between these two they were that level of detail that level of good that level of amazing like just really fantastic craftsmanship was that ever hard to look at like when you're looking at it and going this looks photo were you ever like oh god this is this is extreme no, <laughs> <laughs> no i love it like i would show yeah. up on set and like there's blood all over the ground and a body part laying there you're like you know, i love my like, job <laughs> yeah i just take a little video and be like this is just for me to remember. Like this was what my day was going yeah. to the office, like get a coffee, go see like a, a dismembered body part. Like it's great, you know? Yeah. And so what, in terms of the collaboration, this was a very collaborative movie overall. Like, you know, I'm working with on every trap, you have the art department designing the machine and the, you know, and there's actually a traps department within the art department. That's like designing and developing the traps. You have, you know, wardrobe because all these actors are wearing things. And literally, like, if their wardrobe is wrong, we can't see where the cuts are happening, you know, because you have to think like, mm. oh, like if this person's chopping this off or cutting this off or cutting into this, the wardrobe can't disguise that. And that has right. to be thought about in advance. Um, beyond color palette and look and feel of characters and all that sort of a thing. And then um, there's the effects involved. Not That isn't much of a conversation that. That's more just like, oh, if we know, like, you know, a lot of like timers in the movie, like yeah. those are sort of things that just end, you end up having to be effects and change right? because you shoot it and then the timing's wrong or whatever. And you yeah. just have to clean those up. Yeah. But in general, we're looking, we're doing stunts, you know, with a lot of these, we're doing special effects with a lot of these and we're doing prosthetics. So it's all working in synergy together. And those are just a lot of meetings. There's a lot of conversation, but then also every trap gets tested on this movie. We tested every trap a minimum of three times, maybe four. And what those days look like is you go and you basically, you hit all of the main pieces of the trap to see if they work. I'm not able to do any lighting. I'm not able to test anything with real cameras because it costs more money to rent the cameras. It costs more money to rent the lights and to rent the crew, you know, or to hire the crew. So like you can't, I don't get to look at it. On, in photo real conditions i just get to see what's being made and what's being played with and what's being done and then offer my opinion and my thoughts based on my work in the past yeah so in general though like saw the aesthetic works for prosthetics it's dark sure it's gritty we're doing stuff you know saw cuts very fast yeah. so we're center punching a lot of the images we're doing stuff where it's connecting actor face with prosthetic connecting actor face with prosthetic yeah you know in movement it's like right? a jigsaw or puzzle. In cut. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah and and kevin you know i have to give all credit to kevin for he understands the movie he understands what it is what it means he understands you know when you set up the trap you need to be on the nose about the cuts so that like the audience gets the essential information you know mm-hmm. the audience wants to know what are the stakes and be able to to be able to put themselves into the world. And like so much of this is about subjectively placing the audience into John Kramer's world, but also placing the audience subjectively into the world of the traps where you feel, you know, cause you're like, I mean, we're literally for the tube trap, you know, we're it's, you know, we call it the janitor trap, like, cause it's a janitor. Mm -hmm. You're, we're literally taking the camera placing it into this tube. 
So mm. you get a point of view from, you know, the janitor's point of view. And like, how do you like put a camera inside of a tube? And we're buying bigger, a bigger tube. And I'm using right. a black magic pocket camera with a tinier lens and, you know, are using probe lenses and things like that. And so those are all like a part of that conversation. We're shooting tests, we're shooting, you know, with like cameras and stuff, but not with our hero cameras because we just couldn't afford the extra days. And so, um, and then it, you know, and Kevin was, you know, we would we met up together and talked about shot list, but Kevin was spending a lot of time like playing around with like Artemis has like a 3D like platform. I don't remember the name of it, but you can develop your sets in Mm -hmm. 3D and then you can play with camera angles. And Kevin just knows, you know, he's been cutting these movies, he's been cutting for a long time. He knows he understands what it takes. Yeah. And he also understands what it takes to develop a sequence. You know, he saw cuts, I think there's 4,000 edits in the movie or something like it's, it's a, you know, the movie cuts. And so you have to shoot it in a way where it's going to cut really well. And I operated a camera for most of the movie for four of six weeks of shooting. And then I fell sick with COVID and had to work. Yeah. I had to work from a trailer and like I was on a walkie with a headset with my operator. So operators on a headset, uh, console and gaffer on a walkie. And I had my, my lighting diagram. And by that point we were in this like main space. Um, there's maybe 20 locations in the movie or something like that. But once we land in one of them, a lot of the movie happens in that location. Hmm. And so I ended up, you know, I was able to communicate for two days that way and just like changing values on lights and asking for what I wanted to be, implemented and then we shut the production down for five days because um a few other people fell sick and so Mm -hmm. after that point though i was too like felt too weak to operate because i was pretty like tired and yeah i was Mm -hmm. symptomatic until i was symptomatic for the first few days so they kept me i was offset they ran lines out to a trailer that was just offset and so like i wasn't able to like be in same space with anyone uh, but I, yeah, I was sick. I got pretty sick. And then, mm. um, you know, by the time we were rolling again, I was feeling like I was well and not symptomatic and feeling better, but I mm. wasn't. I just, my ability to like, my strength was a lot weaker and my, um, I just was worried about operating and overseeing two cameras while, you know what I mean? Yeah. While operating and just shooting the, this huge amount of material. So then I also got food poisoning the the, the week <laughs> after Jeez. that. So I ended up vomiting on set because I like was so like food. Po- so I had to step off set for like 40 minutes to get like an IV drip. And then I came back. And I'm surprised just, they didn't you use that keep to, going. Yeah. I'm surprised they didn't use that to market the movie. <laughs> the crew was throwing up on set. You know, it's like just stretch it a little yeah, bit. You know, but ultimately like, yeah, it just takes everybody working together and like, you know, I would ask the prosthetics team, Hey, like what's, you know, where are the seams? Where are the, Mm -hmm. you know, what's, and we would just ask. And we knew like, you know, part of breaking the shot list down is you have to break down. These are special effect shots and you have to think about your order and that you can't make that the AD's job. Like that's Kevin's job. That's my job. It's like, I'm lighting in a way that like gives us, you know, the most flexibility possible. And I'm having to keep track of all the cues and all the what's on when and where, you know, and, um, my crew did a good job with that, but frankly, like the just the breakdown in communication between like English and Spanish still existed. So like sure. um, that's just a reality. And so yeah. Kevin and I are breaking out, like, okay, this happens, and then we send this person off for this makeup change while we're shooting the stunt double with this shot, and then we get them back in an hour and a half and we shoot this piece. So even while you're doing these traps, you're having to do these big makeup transitions and you lose people so you have to shoot out and you just have to and the main thing is how do you never stop shooting you know what i mean yeah. and you just have to like design your day to like minimize that because mexico is amazing and great and there's so much great about the country and about the film industry there but one of the challenges of it was their day was 12 hours from the moment we arrived to the moment we finished oh, wow. so lunch and breakfast are a part of that time and so you lose that out of your day and then the other aspect was it's just um, you work six day weeks. That's just what you do. And so we were working six day weeks, but you work a half day on Saturday, which means you work uh, 8 a.m. till 3 p.m. 
which is so really you know, nine like to two. Day. Yeah. Yeah. If you're yeah. A short meals. half day. Well, you don't get lunch on that day. So oh, okay. lunch is one well, lunch is after. So it's really like you're working nine to three, but it's like, you know, that it is a half day, but at the same time, you're like, that doesn't give you the time to be prepping for the next week. And you're exhausted because you're rolling one week into the next. And the other side is the end time is set. It's three. So you could go late the day before, but then you would have to start later because of mm. actor turnarounds the next day. No. And then you don't only get the limited window. So we really couldn't, we couldn't just like, like I came back to the U S and then shot another horror movie a month later. And I worked, it was my first union job. I worked six day weeks on that. And I worked worse hours and harder hours in a way because we had to do six day weeks on that. And, but it was union. So they're like, yeah, we'll just pay the extra penalties and we'll just yeah. run it hard, you know, whereas this we're like, we will lose time shooting if we go over. Yeah. So it's, it is the schedule, you know, the schedule is a big part of it. And um, it, we went over very little on this movie uh, and we were, we were really organized and we moved really quickly. And because of all the testing that we did, things, we did still have some hiccups, you know, the the littlest thing can be, can take, you know, I mean, can slow you down. And um, we had no real major hiccups in terms of like anyone getting really hurt. You know, I think we had one person get hurt once on one trap and hmm. it was a minimal, you know, it was a minimal uh, burn that somebody got, you know what did I mean? Did it make so it in the movie? It's still scary. Maybe uh, I feel like if I'm an person. actor, I'm I feel or a stunt person. I feel like I'm like you better use that <laughs> if we. Yeah, if I, I mean, it, yeah, it was actually like a smoke device, like mm. the, the the heating element for the smoke oh, wow. device touched the actor's skin while we were shooting because there was smoke pouring yeah. out in the scene and and they you know so we just had to cut and they you know we fixed it pretty quick but so maybe their initial like flailing Reaction. or whatever might have happened right yeah. um yeah but no in general it's like we you know we set out to you know we had a decent amount of prep and we set out to make something and then you you're in it and it's really hard but it's what you're there to do and it's a lot of fun and you know kevin was always like yeah is this he's like sometimes people talk about movies like they're hell and it's like they're not hell they're really hard they're a lot of fun and Frankly, the hardest thing about making the movie was like my dog died like while oh. I was making this movie and I was away from home for four months of my life, you know, and and it was during a transitional period of my mm. personal life, you know, and so I'd have that dog for 10 years, you know, and oh. um, so it's like I had to like say goodbye over a phone and that's, you know, that's sad and disappointing, but it's like the 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 hardship is it is difficult and it is long hours that is what you sign up for to get to play make believe, you know, and I, I, you know, and, and hopefully I get to do this again with Kevin very soon, you know? So that's, that's, you know, and I, you heard it here first, uh, the saw sequel is coming. So there you go. (laughs) (laughs) Um, um, Well, last question here. I appreciate your time. Um, uh, You, a lot of people, you mentioned the shot of Billy rolling into the warehouse when you watch the trailer, whatever channel it's been uploaded to, everyone's in the comments adding a timestamp for the shot where the camera's mounted on the tray behind Billy. <laughs> like, this is the greatest shot ever. Oh my God, this is like, we're back to saw, you know, like that shot resonated with people. Um, I just want to ask you, like, what is the shot, you know, maybe in the trailer or, or maybe in the movie that you're most proud of? Um, and was it intentional on the day? Like, this is an iconic shot. Um, and then, um, you know, what was it like kind of seeing that assembled with that iconic music for the first time? Oh my God. Yeah. I'll answer the last question or of that first. Like when I saw, so Kevin invited me over to his house to watch the movie once they had a, a locked studio cut. Okay. Um, Cause Kevin's not really a big believer in like director's cuts when most of the trims that were made, I mean, there's 35 minutes of deleted scenes from the movie and it's still an hour 58 or wow. something. I think. Oh, so um, you know, Kevin's very meticulous and fast and very much like he constantly just wipes away, wipes away, wipes away and mm-hmm. gets it, you know, condenses it. And the movie moves fast. Like it, it's that runtime, but it's, it's a saw cut, like it moves. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of material that didn't make the movie, you know, and that got cut and fans will get to see it. You know, it should be on the Blu-ray. Studios like love that. that extra 30 minutes of footage they get to add in yeah. <laughs> to the cut later. Yeah. yeah you know, 
I mean, th- yeah, I mean, I think it'll it'll probably never be because Kevin's like, you know, this is the director's cut. Like mm-hmm. we had to make a few trims for the MPA, but nothing that killed the movie. And yeah. like, um, you know, we uh and nothing that like ultimately like makes the movie not the movie. And so that's and that is just a thing with you know, Saw is on the edge of what's possible in an R-rated movie, and the studio yeah. won't release an NC 17 movie. So we we have to play the line and get it as far to the edge as we can, you know. Um when I saw the cut, I and the Hello Zap theme came on because of course, like, you know, it's Saw, like you can't do it without that theme. I had goosebumps, you know, mm-hmm. and it, and it and it's the movie is I, well, wait, you know, I'll let the audience decide what they think about the movie. But when I saw it, I was like, holy fucking shit. I was involved. I made this. Like, I shot this. Like, this feels like out of body. Like, I wasn't involved at all. Like, I just watched, you know, this amazing movie that, like, I heard, you know, and I had all these goosebumps and feelings about just as an audience member, let alone as the person that shot this. And so that was really exciting and really fun. I, um, yeah, it's been... There's been so many parts of that have been so rewarding, especially in my career. It's the biggest film I've shot. It's the mm-hmm. most wide release thing I've shot. And um, it's exciting to know people are going to see my work and also on a movie that I'm just so proud of. And um, also, you know, that's kind of the moment it became real was when I saw the movie because I was, it's just, yeah, we had a really great opportunity in front of us. And I think we were able to do something really special. Um in terms of iconic shots, it's funny because I actually don't remember how that shot with Billy like came up, but we that was like a conversation that we had, like, and we were kind of like talking about it, like it would be kind of fun to do like something like this. And so then my my like in Mexico, the the system of crew is a little different. You don't have like at least when I've worked there, it's not like gaffer then key grip. It's like gaffer and then his crew, and so they do it all. And so mm-hmm. my gaffer, this guy named um, Nacho Sanchez. My crew's names were Sitlali, Vanessa, Pepe, um, Rodrigo, Nacho. I don't remember the names of everyone else, but like, yeah, it was a very like, oh, Ed, like Luzania. Um, great crew, fantastic people. They did a fantastic job. But he built like a rig that was basically like speed rail connected to the bicycle. And then we push it with the speed rail and then mount the camera on the speed rail and do that kind of shot. And Kevin loved it because Kevin was like, well, this is so like, this is like, clearly like we understand that this is, there's a bit of camp, you know, to what, yeah, right. like this moment, but it's also, it's funny, but it's also dark. And it's like, here, we're going to roll out with all these medical devices. Like, um, I mean, I was excited to light Billy. I was like, this is my chance to light Billy. It's iconic. Like he, you know, like we joked about him being a celeb and like, we all took f- selfies with him and like, yeah. you know, we were like, well, Biggs is trailer and shit like that. You know, it's a d- dumb, but fun. and. I don't know in terms of my favorite like iconic sort of shots in the movie. I mean, we've got some pretty great like techno crane shots in the movie. Mm-hmm. There's some pretty fun snap zooms in the movie. There's some pretty fun circular dolly track. You know, I think the most fun I had was just once once we got like I love shooting under cranked material where it's like six frames a second, mm-hmm. two seventy degree shutter, you know, giving you that like really like you know, kind of like whip around kind yeah. of feel like and and I love doing that material. I've done it on music videos and commercials and I've used it, never used it in a movie. And so it was fun to do that. And then some of the material, it's like I brought, I have a little black magic 6k camera. And so while we were shooting stuff on the Venice, once I saw what the operators were getting and I was happy, I'm like, well, there's no reason for me not to jump out and start shooting some other stuff for this trap. So I would take my black magic, throw the frame rate down to six and two seventy degree shutter. And then I would take like lens and I would lens whack and just like pop it off the mount and do crazy stuff to get those. Like, you know, they would used to do stuff where they would do rollouts where they would shoot it on film. They would do the three sixty until they rolled out. And then those rollouts would make the cut. Well, since mm-hmm. we're shooting on digital, there's really no way to do a rollout, but we can do yeah. like, under crank lens whacking and then those can get stutter cutted right. into the scene and stuff like that. So for me, that's like a lot of fun, but you know, it really, it's less, it's less me thinking in terms of like iconic shots, the fans will decide. And um, for me, it's more just like the, you know, I feel really great about a lot of sequences and scenes and the way that the, they unfold. And I think I'm really proud of, uh, you know, I'm really proud of what we did in terms of like, 
the structure and arc of the lighting and the feel of the movie. And then it's just fun when you see something get chopped up to bits, you know, and stuff yeah. like that. So you're just L- literally you know, the little yeah. kid. Yeah. And it's like the little kid part of me comes out, you yeah. know, and you know whether you got it or not, because, you know, you'll shoot it and then you only have two resets and you're like, I mean, literally the warehouse floor in the, uh, in, that we, like we, we built the entire floor with linoleum so that we could wipe blood up for resets, you know yeah. what I mean? And, and it's built to look like concrete, but you know, it's just, you really think about that, but no, I mean, yeah. it's, yeah, I, I don't, I think we do go in because we have to rent special gear to do a lot of these shots. You know, techno crane is something we could carry for four or five days. Mm. Um, a jib and a remote head is something we can carry for a few days, you know, right. Uh, steady cam, same thing. Same with like, um, you know, doing any sort of, yeah. So the specialty gear, like we are intentional and for us, you know, the end of the first act ends with some big camera movements. The end of the second act ends with that and starts with, you know, a techno crane shot starts the third act. So like they're, that's very chosen. Um, and it's intentional, but in terms of what the fans will consider iconic or not, I don't know, you know, yeah. find out. I guess we will. Well, if you're listening or watching this uh, episode, go find out what those iconic shots are. Um, and um, it should be out right around the time of this release. So excited for myself to see it. I haven't seen it yet. Excited for people to go see it. And um, yeah, I'm I'm really excited about it. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to chat through it. Um, I could talk for another hour and a half, uh, but I won't make you do that. Um, but no, I really, really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to what you do next and, and, uh, all the things the future has in store. Thank you so much. It's really great to meet you and I hope, uh, yeah, just gave you a little window into what we did. And it's so cool that we have a lot of <laughs> yeah. similar background. Yeah. We'll so it's a, a small club. Yeah. Small club. <laughs>